<clears throat> so today we're in uh, the fourth of the five values. We've looked at, uh, of course, started out with focused outreach, biblical truth, Christ-centered worship. <clears throat> but here's the deal about all that. You, you can have uh, good biblical teaching. You can have your mind and your eyesight set on the community and uh, those that are, don't belong. And you can really make the attempt to do a wonderful Christ-centered worship. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't care, none of it's going to matter. This is an extremely important value uh, that we adhere to here at First Baptist. I want you to take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to uh, Galatians chapter number 5. Now, we just looked at this a few months ago. And um, we're going we're gonna to look at it a whole lot more different than we did back then. And I want to carry you through the first 10 verses of chapter number 6. Galatians chapter 5. And why don't you stand with me and uh, let's begin reading in verse 25. Galatians 5 and uh, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit... Let's also walk in the Spirit. Let, let's not be desirous of vainglory or boasting, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, get glory right now in this time. Through your word, expose yourself, and in the process of us seeing you, may we see ourselves more clearly and how far away we are from you so that we could be conformed more to your image. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. Please uh, be seated. I hope that you noticed while we were going through there, the terms that he uses like brothers and brethren and household of faith. What he's talking here primarily about, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are part of a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ uh, when we come to know Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. I want to make this statement now. Listen very carefully what I'm telling you. The conduct toward others that we have is determined by how we see ourselves. How we treat others is in direct proportion to how we view our own selves. The emphasis today is on intentional care. How you and I are to care for and to treat one another. But, but, but I want you to notice something here uh, in the last part of chapter number five. Here's what he says. He says, if we walk, uh, if we live in the spirit, in, in other words, You've had a time in your life that you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. And if we live in the Spirit, or since we derive our life uh, in the Spirit of God, what does he say? Since that's true, walk in the Spirit. Uh, that, that term there is really unique. It means to keep in step with the Spirit. How, how many military people are in the building? You, you at some time or another served in the military. You, you know that term very well about keeping in step, don't you? 
And, and if you got out of step, oh my, if you were in a formation and you were marching and you got out of step, you paid the price for it. So, so what he's talking about says now that uh, your life is derived in Christ, the Spirit of God lives in you, then keep in step with the Spirit of God. And then he goes on to say, now some of you are conceited uh, and you're boastful. Uh, in other words, what they were doing there, they had some kind of superficial spiritual uh, superiority that they saw some other Christians that they deemed weren't nearly as mature as they were. He says, now you don't need to be boastful about that. When you think you're somebody, then you're nobody. And then he says, those same people who look down at those that are weak in the faith are the very ones that look at others that they seem to think have more of a walk with God, that are deeper in their faith with God. Then they get filled up with envy and want what they have. And he says, quit that. Stop that. And he's saying, you know what? You just really need to come to grips with who you are in Christ. Because those two things indicate you really don't know who you are. So stay in step with the Spirit of Christ. And when you do that, he says you will fulfill the royal law. That's the law of Christ. And we all know what that law is, right? We are to love one another. As we love ourselves. That's the great commandment. By the way, you do love yourself, don't you? Shake your head like that. Let me know. I'm breathing out here. Uh, we, we're to love one another. Why is that? That's the first fruit of the Spirit. If you look back just a little bit, you'll discover that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. So that's that first commandment. Then, then, then our ministry here at First Baptist Church in Indian Trail ought to be a ministry of love. Exactly, you're tracking with me. Now, we talk a whole lot about that, don't we? We, we, we really, I'm, I love you, man, I love this, I love it. We talk a lot about it. But I wonder sometimes if we really have some deep, concrete expressions of it. If it's just words, or do we really live it out? So, so what Paul is saying here in these opening verses, he says, keep in step. Now, hear my heart a minute. If we're going to be a church that claims to have intentional care as our value, I think that Paul is giving us here four absolute essentials that are to be trademarks of our church, trademarks of every believer. I want you to notice the first one with me as it's found in that very first verse of chapter number six. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest ye be tempted likewise. Powerful words. So I want you to write somewhere down the word restoring. If we're to be a church of intentional care, then we have to be a restoring Church. Now notice the word in here, overtaken. Now I've shared this with you before. It won't be uh, news to some of you, but for some of you it will be. It, it means that you're walking in the Spirit and, and you're in union with the Spirit and everything is going good and all of a sudden, without warning, without intentionality, without premeditation, boom, you get to walking not in the spirit, but sidestepping the spirit. Get to walking in the flesh, overtaken in a fault. Something that you didn't just decide to do. It's something that overtook you without warning and you get away from God. You don't walk in the spirit. Now we're not talking about somebody that is living a life of continual sin, although you and I do have responsibility even with that person. But he's talking about that person who without any kind of premeditation at all suddenly finds themselves not walking in the Spirit of God. Now, what are we to do with somebody like that? The Bible says we are to restore. Now, what does that mean? It, it, it has a couple of connotations. One, it is a medical term. It, it, uh, it means if, if the bone is broken, 
You are to go and to set that bone so that that bone could be used for what the limb was intended for it to be used. It's also a nautical term. Uh, when a fisherman has a breach in his net, that they are to mend that breach and mend that net so that the net would not have a hole in it. And the disciples uh, knew very well what this meant is that they were fishing and they would draw in the net. There would be a breach in there and they wouldn't catch nearly as many fish with that breach in the net as they would with a whole net. So every day the fishermen would check their nets and if there was a breach or a brokenness in it, then they would mend that net. Why? So that they could catch more fish. Interesting word. Why then are we to do that with people? If somebody gets out of step, if there's a brother or sister that once walked with God and, and, and without any kind of premeditation, boom, they just suddenly get out of fellowship with God, what is our job? Why are we we're, we're to restore them? Why? So that we could catch more fish. Do you remember the 8 to 15 card that I gave you uh, the first Sunday in January? I'm just telling you too, I believe that God began a new work at First Baptist Indian Trail on that day. The 8 to 15 card uh, is uh, one of the most powerful tools that I've ever come across. Matter of fact, since I gave it to you, God's answered five specific prayers that I've been praying with my card. Put, put the, if, can you get the card up there, guys, for a minute? You got it? I, I want you to notice something. Watch this with me right here. Look right here. There is the prodigals, right? There are those that have fallen by the wayside, who were overtaken in a fault right there. And this section up here is the pre-Christians, those that we are seeking to win. May I say to you that we are not going to win these folks up here until we are actively involved in restoring those that are down there. Why is that? God says, if you're not going to take care of what I send you, I'm not going to send you anybody else. So we got to do that. We are to you, you, let the Lord use us to put them back so that we can see more people safe. Hey, by the way, can I say this to you? I think we're having such a difficult time overcoming the world's perception of the church in the 21st century because the church is seen largely as judgmental of others and we are constantly and consistently pouncing on the wounded Christians. And the world sees that. The world identifies that. Well, if that's the way they're going to treat somebody, why would I want to be a Christian? If they're going to be that judgmental, if they're going to be that critical, why would I want to be a Christian? Um... I, I, I D-double dog dare you. Uh, go to one of the arm meetings, the addiction recovery meetings. That it's a ministry of this church. Go to a, if you don't want to do that, go to an AA meeting. And, and in those meetings where people are trying to overcome a, a difficulty in their life, do you know what they do? They'll go in there and they'll say, hey, uh, guys, my name is Mike Whitson. I did this with the arm meeting, I, not because I was addicted to anything, but I went. I wanted to be a part of that ministry. I wanted to see what was going on, and and, and they go. My name is Mike Whitson, and, and I am struggling with alcoholism. I'm struggling with prescription drug addiction. I, I, I'm struggling with alcoholism, and, and they'll openly and blatantly tell you about the faults and the failures of their life. And you ask them, okay, what is it about this setting and in the context of your meetings that you find the freedom to be able to express those kind of very personal issues in your life? Well, what's the difference in that and the context of the church? And they will tell you, because here I won't be judged. Here I won't be condemned. Here people won't look down on me. Here people look at me the same as everybody else. They don't look at me differently. Um, Paul says 
Restore the fallen brother. Don't pounce on them. Don't condemn them. Bring them back into line. Encourage them and mend them so that they could become part of the body of Christ and be used effectively to reach more souls for the glory of God. Now who's to do that work? He identifies it pretty clearly here. He says, you who are spiritual. Now he did not say the spiritually elite. He said, you who are, and you could use this word probably interchangeably, uh, maybe even more effectively, you who are mature. Uh, you, you who are mature. Romans chapter 15 says, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. And, and, and that's us. We, we who are strong, we who are mature ought to bear or put up with the feelings of the weak. Let, let me help you understand something. I, I go into churches all over the country and, and I'm really stopped some of that because I, I, I just I have a burden for being right here. But, but I go in these churches, here, here's what the pastors will tell me. Well, Mike, uh, you know, my church could really be doing a lot better than it is uh, if it weren't for the weak Christians that we have in our fellowship. I hear it all the time. Evangelists uh, traveling around, they say, well, we just didn't have a very good arrival. It's the weakest church I've ever been in in my life. Let me help you what, what the word says. The word says the problem in these churches is really not the weak and the immature. The problem is with the spiritually mature who are not doing and functioning and carrying out the role that God told them to do. There's where the issue is. Now, now how are we to do that work? The, the Bible says, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or gentleness. He didn't say go in there like a district attorney and shake your finger in the face of the accused and say, well, you're sorry, low down, good for nothing. You're guilty of what you... No. He said you do it in the spirit of gentleness and you do it in the spirit of meekness because the fact of the matter, that could be you instead of them. You see, you're capable of doing what they did and a whole lot worse. And so you to treat them with a gentleness that you would expect if that were you in that seat instead of them. So, so, so it's a powerful thing. This intentional care, restoring those that have stepped out of line. I, I, I believe with all of my heart, and I, I think I can say this with integrity and, and, and with the deepest sense of belief in my heart that I can muster up. I believe First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, is absolutely a church where you would never, ever have to fear of coming forward and saying, I'm hurting. I, I messed up. I don't believe you would ever be condemned. I don't believe people would judge you. I don't believe people would put you down. I believe you're in the midst of a group and a body of believers here at First Baptist Church that would do nothing in the world but put their arms around you and encourage you and pray for you as you come to grips with the fact that you got out of step with God. Let me give you number two. I, I spent a long time on number one, but let me give you number two. Not only the word restoring, I want you to see the word bearing. Bearing. Notice verse two, if you will. Chapter 6, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If you read 2 Corinthians, you find out that the Corinthian believers, uh, they got to pointing fingers at the Apostle Paul. And they were very critical of him, very judgmental of him. And he was writing back to them and he says, let, let me just tell you what happened to me. He said, I got such a burden on me that it nearly crushed me. That's the term that's used right here in verse number two, to, to bear one another's burdens. I, 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 that, I was nearly crushed. 
And the, the load that I was carrying was beyond my ability to handle. And because of that, I despaired even of life. It about killed me. And Corinthian church, none of you came up to help bear my load. An, an extremely uh, powerful example of what Paul is talking about here at this point of uh, bearing one another. Let me, let me just ask all of you in this room. Are, are you going through a time in your life right now that maybe you've never been before and the weight of the load that you're carrying is way beyond your ability to bear and it's about to crush you and, and you, if something doesn't happen, you don't know how you're going to make it? That, that's what Paul is simply saying you understand that First Baptist Church Indian Trail is a church that will bear those burdens by encouragement, by offering sympathy and a thousand other ways to come alongside of you. By, by the way, let me help you understand something. If you're not there yet, hang on, you will get there because there will inevitably be something come up in your life somewhere along the way between now and the time Jesus calls you home that you won't be able to handle it. Mm. I can't tell you the numbers of times that uh, that reality has hit my life. I, I'm basically a loner in my makeup, in, in the way God shaped me and formed me and fashioned me. I, I am basically a loner. And uh, God called me to preach. And, and, and you know, I, I just didn't like being around people. Well, now you can't pastor a church if you don't like being around people. Uh, and, and I read a book, John Maxwell has been a long distance mentor and, and, and personal friend of mine. And uh, I'll never forget the, the thing that introduced me to him was a book that he wrote called Be a People Person. And, and I read that book and, I, and the Holy Spirit of God got me and said, Mike, if you're going to be successful in the ministry, you're going to have to learn to love people. And, and, and God did a work in my heart that, that continues even to this day. But in the midst of that, there are still a lot of times when, when I get crushed when the burdens get so heavy that I can't bear them, I, I, I want to tell you, God surrounded me with some people that came and just lifted up my arms and held up my arms, prayed with me, encouraged me, and offered me assistance to the point that I could get out from under that burden. Bear one another's burdens. Why? Because you fulfill the law of Christ. What is that law? Love. May I help you with a little bit? You've heard it sung all morning long. You've worshipped with the music already and the lyrics uh, to the songs this morning have just said it so beautifully. I want to tell you, Jesus loves you and he still cares about you. And he says, cast all your cares, cast all your burdens on me because I care for you. He loves you. Number three, notice verse three. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now here's the word, the third word. We've, we've looked at restoring and we've looked at bearing Notice this word, it's the word testing. Testing. He, what's he saying at this point? He, he's saying, some of you think that you are too good to bear somebody else's burden. Some of you think more highly of yourself than you ought to think of yourself. Uh, some of you are haughty. And some of you think that you're too good to get down in the dirt and grovel with somebody else's burden. Paul's identifying that. Now, restoring and bearing and then testing. He says, you better be careful. You better start examining your own life. Notice, notice what he said. 
He said, but let every man prove. Let every man examine his own life. Prove his uh, own work. Have you ever noticed something about, I was, on, I was on the phone. I was on the phone with a, with a guy about, I don't know, two weeks ago. And, and frankly, I was, I was doing a little bit of being a prophet and, and probably speaking into his life a little more sternly than I normally do. And, and, and he, then the first thing came out of his mouth was, well, I'm going to tell you, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm better than most. I, I'm living better than most. Isn't it amazing what a habit that we get into comparing who we are with somebody else? I told him, I said, hey, man, I, I, I need to enlighten you. They're not your standard. Jesus is the standard. But we compare ourselves with, with uh, other people. And Paul says, stop that. Quit comparing yourself with somebody else and examine your own life. And then in verse number five, he says, for every man shall bear his own burden. A lot different now, a lot different, Jay, than verse two. Verse two is talking about a burden that is so heavy, so difficult, so massive that it is beyond your ability to carry and it's about to crush you. Verse 5 is a different word altogether and he says that this burden is a burden that you are expected to carry and that you have the ability to carry. It, it really is kind of like a military term about a soldier's backpack and the things that go in that soldier's backpack, that soldier is expected to, to, to strap that backpack on and to carry that backpack like every soldier should. Uh, th that's the analogy that he's drawing. It's his task to carry it. So the question here this morning is, are you carrying the load that you're supposed to carry? Or are you trying to shovel your load onto somebody else and let them do for you what you ought to be doing for yourself? So there must be an examination. There must be a testing. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful today if every church member would simply sit down and examine their own life and simply ask, hey, am I carrying my load? Do, do I carry my load in praying? Do I carry my load in telling others about Jesus? Do I carry my load in giving? Do I carry my load in sharing? Do I carry my load in teaching? So he says, test yourself, examine yourself. And, and then there's the final word is sharing. The final word is sharing. Pick it up in verse 6. Uh, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all things. Don't be deceived. What, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. And if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I want you to notice something with me in the Scripture. He didn't say... Uh, as you have enough time. He says, when you have opportunity. I wonder how many people are here this morning or like me that oftentimes look back and see where you really missed out on an opportunity that God gave you. You ever had that in your life? I don't know how it made you feel, but it sure makes me feel pretty, pretty lousy. When God gives you an opportunity, seize it. About a month ago, this, this guy who was uh, inebriated um, called me up. And he said, Pastor, I, I just want you to know, I, I know I haven't seen you in a few years. Uh, but I still love you and I admire you and I respect you. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just at the end of myself. I've, I've lost everything. 
and uh, I'm at the end of my rope. I need help. And whatever God tells you to tell me, I'm going to do it. I said, uh, all right. I said, it's uh, Sunday. In two days, uh, we have a ministry that meets in Monroe called ARM. I'll have some people waiting on you there. And I want you to show up at ARM. He says, I'll do it. He said, that's exactly what I need. Uh, and, and, and I know you wouldn't steer me wrong. And, and I, I promise you I'll be there. I picked up the phone. I called the guys and I said, hey, guys, watch out. There's a guy coming. I, I want you to be looking for him. Be watching for him. He's coming. Wednesday I called. Thursday I called somewhere along in there. I said, did he show up? Well, no, he didn't come. So we called him back up and we say, uh, hey, hey, man, what happened? I don't want to talk to anybody. Don't you send anybody to my house. I'm not going down there to that meeting. Don't want to see anybody down there like that. Now, what are you going to do? A lot of people would say, well, pastor just let him stew in his own juice. Is that what we ought to do? Is that what we ought to do? No. The Bible says we are to do good to all people. Let us, do you see the verse? Let us not grow weary in well-doing. For we will reap if we don't give up. If we don't faint. If we don't throw in the towel. So we look at restoring, bearing, testing, and sharing. I do believe with all of my heart we're moving in that direction. And he says, especially in the household of faith, pick up those that are fallen. Especially those that are in the household of faith. Bear those burdens especially in the household of faith. Test yourself, examine yourself. Especially in the household of faith, we are to share our time, our energies, our talents. We're to share them. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.